hello everybody welcome to the friday multicast i want to thank everybody that's joining today and then everyone that's watching this offline uh today we are going to go over the process of a security workflow it's a checklist uh some of the things that we just wanted to bring up before we started is this is much more about the path that users or application traffic is taking through your network so it's much more about why these little spots are going to matter what products you have or solutions are in there to take care of that and use this as you know either take notes along the way or feel free to reach out to Jay and I or your other Cisco SC and we can actually walk through these together change it to modify for actually your location and then we'll back provide it to you as a PowerPoint just so you're aware of what it is in your environment so if you want to schedule that reach out to us anytime we are more than willing to always help you guys see what how your environment looks and we'll go from there I'm going to go ahead and start yeah, I, sharing. I think this conversation this week kind of feeds back to you know, one of the questions we had at the, the last multicast on the Hot Wing Challenge about are firewalls still relevant, right? And obviously that's a loaded question. Of course firewalls are still relevant. Um, but, you know, there's an entire security program that needs to go around that. Um, it, it's, not, it's not as simple as it used to be where everybody comes in and sits in the office and, and sits behind a firewall and a proxy all day, every day, especially right now with all the remote work going on, right? So there's a lot of different parts and pieces to uh, to a good security program. That's kind of what we're going to step through today. All right, I think I've got this set up. All right, so the first one that we're actually going to go through here, let me change my pointer to a laser. Okay. And kind of, kind of to point out, I mean, the gist of this flow chart is, you know, obviously we're going to put Cisco products in here as examples. Um, but I think the point we're really trying to make is that you don't have to be using Cisco in every one of these boxes, right? Um, but you, you should probably have something doing each of these things in, in your environment. Um, and if not, then that may be a gap you, you want to look at getting filled. Yeah. And this is where when we actually do a personal one on one with you for this, we will actually change these boxes to indicate whether you have a no solution. If it's a non Cisco, what is it? So it's a Windows or if you have a different firewall, if you're doing something different on the server end, uh, this will actually be customized to your environment so you can see how your flows are looking like, oh, wow, we don't have any solution for this. Where should we maybe look and spend some time to see what we would want to put in there? And so the first, and today we're doing just three traffic flows. We're doing corporate manage to the internet and then breach defense as far as users with with getting emails sent over to them on how you can secure those those devices. So to start with, we're going to go with the corporate managed, and obviously we're going to start with the endpoint that's trying to reach either an application or a service that's being done. And the most important thing on the endpoint is, of course, what type of anti-malware, antivirus you have. You want this in case for some reason if it's infected, you can try and quarantine this. You don't want it to be trying to spread. Obviously, we have Cisco AMP for endpoints, but there's so many other solutions out there. So it, you'll want to at least ensure we have something that's there on the device that's just checking to ensure that endpoint is a secure, clean endpoint. The next portion that you go to is once you're trying to access the application, you need to know where you're going. So you're going to want some type of DNS security on that. You want to ensure that it's not a incorrect redirect that's going to go somewhere for a payload. You want to make sure that your DNS is secure. People can't make changes to it. We have Umbrella for that. Uh, there's a few other ones out there, but the reason you want that is just to ensure you don't get redirected to a, let's say you think you're going to an application, but really you're going out to a website that's going to put some type of malicious payload into your endpoint. Uh, depending on firewalls, there's other options. Usually with what we see is Windows is just enabled or is it disabled if you're worried about that? It's just more of a best practice. We don't have, I get, AMP for endpoint takes care of the device, but we don't put like a AMP firewall on it per se. So it's just one of those that if you have a personal firewall you want to put on endpoints, you put it inside here. Uh, and then now we're going to start leaving that traffic from the endpoint. So how do we know that this device is actually a either an employee device, a actual company device that should have access to it? You want some type of mobile device management. And that just ensures you can do some type of health check to make sure that you like if you're using Qualys, that if it meets this criteria, is it patched? When was the last time it's had software uh, updates done to it? So you can apply all those metrics to ensure that that device is in compliance with what you want it to be on your network. So we have Cisco Meraki for that. But you, the reason why you want that is to ensure the device that's going to be on your network meets the criteria 
for how you want to manage it. Moving yeah, from and the also, yep, go ahead, you know, Jake. an important piece of that too is ensuring whether or not it is a corporate owned device, right? I mean, we see that all the time right now with intent based networking because there, there's always a mixture of corporate owned devices and employee owned devices and, and guest devices, right? And we usually want to segment those traffic off into two, maybe three different networks. Um, so just verifying whether or not a device is corporate owned is, is a big piece of that puzzle. Yeah, very important for BYOD too, if you're bringing your own devices to make sure that how do you manage those even if you don't own them. So that's where that MDM comes into play. Once we ensure those devices sh are on the network, how are we going to ensure that those devices are what they say they are? That's how you're gonna use your, your NAC. For us, we've got ICE. This is where you can do profiling, ensure that this user is actually part of the correct U group that should have access to it for their network access, change their DACL on the switching if they need to get redirected. If it's an IoT device, you know, it's already segmented, it shouldn't have access to that application to where this is where we start putting the deep security posturing for these devices, accessing resources to ensure, yep, we've checked, it's got a either certificate, however you want to validate those devices, that it is the device that we say it is. So we're gonna to continue to forward that traffic on. We're not gonna put an ACL to redirect them or we're not gonna block it. We're not gonna isolate them. Let's say that your NAC approves it. So we're gonna go then, of course, after you leave, you're gonna to go to the firewall. If you're doing a segmentation between your campus and your data center or your services. So the first one that you'll hit then is the firewall. You do, like we talked about, firewalls are still relevant. You still wanna make sure that the segmentations that are occurring has the check and balance that you're checking to make sure does this user or does this subnet have access to this? Are you doing inspection? So the first thing we're gonna hit is the firewall. We have the firepower firewalls on ours. Once you go in there, if you wanna actually start doing services on those firewalls, either inspection, if you want visibility, um, we have firepower threat defense services that we can run on those firepower firewalls. And like I said, a lot of these, you may not have Cisco, we understand that's not everywhere, but if you do have a different solution, make sure that it's doing these services. Don't just have it there, but not checking what's happening. So this is where we want to ensure services are being ran. It's checking for all these devices before we then continue with that path flow across. So once we leave, the other thing that's gonna be important here is also any type of analytics. Something that really stands out when you go to security, and this is uh, kind of true for me with one of my customers, is there was something strange happening on the network, and suddenly a device that probably wasn't generating a lot of traffic was now probing everywhere, trying to figure out where services were, where their weak points, reaching out, all just sprawling ever everywhere. That had we had some type of flow analytics, and so for us at Cisco StealthWatch to know that, hey, this device usually does a few kilobytes. It's like sending megabits of traffic across the network. It's probably not gonna just block it down unless you want it set up that way, but it might be something you wanna take a look at. So you get an alert, or you can actually set policies up to anything that's over a threshold. We can you know, block that off and quarantine, investigate, and go back and change it to a normal. But little things like that that can add up to where if it's an IoT device that's generating a lot of traffic that doesn't before, you might have to worry about it being compromised. And so we've got Selfwatch that helps with flow analytics, but there's other vendors that do it. It's just something to be aware of to get that complete picture of security of, we have these things, or if you're missing products, you can try and use some of these to try and step up where something's not. But that's where Selfwatch really comes into handy is to see that picture on the wire, what's happening across. Visibility is a huge part of it, right? I mean, it, it, it's easy to make rules and say, okay, this binary, this hash is, is a virus, right? I definitely never want that in my network, you know? So we have all sorts of different tools that detect that, whether it's in the firewall with AMP or, or on the endpoint with AMP. Um, but visibility in, into anomalies, right? Like things that may be normal um, today, but weren't normal last week, or don't seem normal today, but weren't, weren't normal last week. Um, you know, data exfiltration is a great example. I mean, that's kind of the example you used there, but you know, I got a database server that has terabytes of data. Um, it's moving data around within the network all the time, right? I mean, that's literally its job. And then one day it starts talking out to the internet. Um, that might yep. be okay, right? Maybe I started cloud services, but if I didn't, that's not normal. It needs to be investigated, right? That, that exactly. can be data exfiltration. That can be customer data leaving the network. And you know, that, that may look like normal traffic to, to a next-gen firewall. So 
Um, you definitely need some anomaly detection and, and that sort of thing to, to look for crazy, hidden, stealthy stuff like that. <laughs> yep. Uh, and then moving on to even products that Cisco doesn't have but are still very important to have in your environment is what type of logging and reporting do you have? So we put Splunk on here. There's a ton of different vendors that you can have if you wanted to put logging on there. Then if we're going to coordinate all those, where are we going to put those? How are we going to funnel all these messages together? And so once again, Cisco doesn't have a SIM, but there are SIMs out there to get those. And then something that's really important that I would w just want to mention real fast is when we do have Secure X up and running, we have integration with those SIMs to be able to pull those messages out. So even though we're not a SIM company, we can still use SIMs to be able to get a picture of what's happening in your environment. So we've gone through the endpoints, crossed the networks through the firewalls, and then finally, then on the server endpoints, it's important to still have security on that side. Just because we segmented, it doesn't mean we're secure. We need to make sure that the that server endpoint has some type of anti-malware running on it in case it ever, for whatever reason, gets a payload to try and isolate it real quickly, just to know what's happening. And once again, we've got Cisco endpoint. Then how do you ensure that maybe the server wasn't supposed to be talking or this process wasn't supposed to be running to get really granular on what this host or I mean, what the service is supposed to be doing with Cisco Tetration, you can lock that down to east and west traffic to where it shouldn't be going across. This processor shouldn't be running. You can put that policy on to really enforce the security policies you want done. And then lastly, how do you verify that user was supposed to access this in the, in the you know in the first place? With Cisco Duo, you can use the multi auth to ensure, hey, did you really try and access services on this application? If you know if you hit no, then we can we can obviously look at that. But having that holistic picture of being granular on what you want to happen on that device, are you ensuring that Lance has should even be accessing that? Like, did you request access into this application or to this service, and then locking that down? So, like I said, this is one of those that we would love to do with you. Go across, and we'll submit this to you when we're done. About you know here's where you have, here's what you're missing, uh, and even if you don't have Cisco, we. I'm not where nobody will be more upset about it. It's just one of those that we want to help make sure your environment is secure. That's what we're here for is to make you guys as simple and gals as secure as possible. Um, so even if you're not Cisco, please reach out to us and we still will do this with you through the walkthrough. Next one here is employee on site to internet. So the obvious fear here is accessing websites, if you're going to Dropbox, if you're all these locations that users are trying to do on their day to day, either they're part of their job or not part of their job. And how do we put a security picture across that to ensure that traffic flow across the same? And so obviously we'll start here again with the endpoint from the employee reaching out. We've got Cisco endpoint, AMP for endpoints for your antivirus and anti-malware that we've talked about the ability to see what's happening on that device. There's the DNS. Again, we want to ensure that the DNS lookups are secure. They're not being changed and to be alerted if, hey, uh, this is a different DNS that we're not used to seeing or this is a, it's trying to actually look up somewhere that's a hazard um, to have the ability to do that. Again, you want some type of Even firewall. More important, you know, when, when they're reaching yep. out to the internet, right? DNS security is, is a really, really big deal, um, yeah. obviously. and and not just content filtering, but also, I hate to say, but malware protection, you know, just protection against the baddies, right? Um, knowing those sites that are being like pseudo generated domain names, pseudo random generated domain names and, and, and whatnot, um, you can't constantly keep up with everyday content filtering on, on blocking out those sort of domains. So um, being able to have some sort of algorithmic approach um, to being able to identify those bad sites within seconds of them coming onto the internet, right? For Absolutely. command and control of malware, malware or whatever the case may be. Yep. And then once we leave the endpoint, we're now reaching out to the internet. Once again, how do we ensure that this Cisco, I mean, this employee is valid to be able to access the internet or to ensure it should even be on the network? We do the posturing, we identify, we put security group tags, we do all of that to ensure network access control for this device or employee reaching out to it. So again, we have ICE that can handle that. There's other ones out there, but you want to ensure that again, that device that's on your network should be able to reach out to the internet. So this is where you validate that. Again, Stealth Watch, like Jay mentioned, the device that suddenly is reaching out to the internet that never has before, this is something I should be alerted to, I should know. 
Uh, Stealth Watch does a great job of knowing what's happening. If there's a different spike, using that AI to know this is not normal. Especially, this person only works from eight to five, and at 11 p.m., suddenly this thing just kicked off a whole bunch of traffic to get to know what's happening there. We flow across then into the actual firewall inspection. So we've got SSL description to see. All right, do we know what's happening inside this packet? Where is this thing trying to go to? We got Cisco Firepower to handle that, and then with the firewalls we have. Yep, go ahead. On the SSL decryption, um, I can't remember what the stat was I read the other day, but it's like 90% of internet traffic now is encrypted, right? Yep. I mean, every website I go to now is HTTPS. Um, you know, pretty much all my mail traffic is encrypted. Um, so SSL decrypt is important. I, I, I think what's more important is not just decrypt, but just knowing what's going on inside those packets. Um, you know, we've been using SSL decryption for years, right? And it, it, it's always every two or three years, right? We change change up um, encryption technologies, and the the firewall manufacturers and, and proxy manufacturers have to catch up to that, right? Um, I think with with TLS 1.3, and uh, not to go off on a tangent here, but <laughs> I think SSL do decryption <laughs> is uh, is kind of gonna go by the wayside a bit. Um, it it's I hate to use the word impossible, but it's starting to become incredibly difficult to actually do SSL intercept and decrypt and re-encrypt um, with TLS 1.3. So as that becomes mainstream, I think we're going to see other technologies try to step in and fill that gap um, in, in other ways. And actually, if we kind of go a half step back there to the threat intelligence, StealthWatch, you know, Cisco StealthWatch, when paired with uh, Catalyst 9300s, we do encrypted traffic analytics where we can actually look for malware in encrypted traffic without decrypting it. And they have like a 99% efficacy rate with that. Um, I think that and endpoint protection is going to be a big part of securing us um, from those encrypted workflows. The, the irony is the bad guys are using encryption now too, right? So CNC traffic from um, ransomware, it, it's encrypted. It just looks like HTTPS traffic, right? Like. Um, if we can run SSL for our legit apps, the, the bad guys can for theirs too. So yeah. just something else to keep in mind. Yeah, this is where that whole security is a like an onion. There's so many layers that you want to try and just make it as difficult as par par possible for a vulnerability to happen in your environment. The more layers, maybe it's more complicated. Attackers think that's not worth my time. I need to just find somebody else or at least ensuring you have certain things in place to block that. And the other thing that G was talking about, when we start thinking about how much internet traffic has increased over the time that you're going to try and either, if you haven't been able to upgrade your firewalls, you're going to try and do a you know, decryption on these devices. Well, they're going to run hot. So are you even able having the hardware in place to, to do that type of performance that you want? Do you want to try and spend money on hardware that might go into, you know, not uh, might be outperformed within a few years if you keep pushing more things to the internet that that's one of those that's a constant like man i've just purchased this now i've got to buy it again to where if you can try and put some of that decryption at different spots either like on the on the switching with services running to see those analytics uh, it, there's a few options in place rather than just having to upgrade firewall every couple of years because you want to always ensure that you have the decryption needed for it and also then you lose your throughput for it so once we go through there, we're inside the firewalls. We're doing all these services. You're you're looking for your anti-malware. Do you are we blocking locations that are we known are bad, like North Korea? Uh, do we have application visibility? Do we put intrusion prevention? All these services that we normally expect on our firewalls. Do you not only have a firewall? Do you have these turned on? So these are again areas that we can. It's like oh, I don't think I actually have this set up, so we can put no solution on for right there. Um, when we go through this together, so you know. Long term, we should probably maybe look at spend some time looking to see if one of these are not set up correctly or we're not running. I think a lot of times we see firewalls set up, but they don't have their services running to actually either they're in monitor mode, so they can't enforce anything. So it's just it's there doing stuff, but I didn't even know I didn't have it enabled. So it's just one of those that it's a good time to go check, make sure things are configured properly, so that we were we're secured as we can. Uh, moving That's across. That's a great distinction. I yeah. mean, buying it is one thing, implementing it's another. If you buy it and you have it sitting there on the shelf, or even if you have it in line, but just monitoring and, and not properly alerting and not properly doing it, doing any protection, it's, it's still a red box. Even though you paid for it, you got to set it up and use it. Yep. 
And then we've got logging. Again, this isn't a Cisco product. We need something to be able to put logs to. Where are we going to funnel all these logs to to be able to get some type of uh, historical data on it? And now we're going across into actually the internet. So we're left. We're going across. We've got hopefully some type of web security. We've got umbrella, uh, WSA, anything that, you know, putting a layer of security out inside the internet if we can get to that point. And then once we get up there, how? Do, so if we're going to the cloud for this website, how do you ensure that what's going up there isn't going to be taken down? That that is going to be like a mass data pull from your OneDrive or you know something that you've got up there. You can use Cisco Cloud Lock to ensure that, but through a uh, cloud security broker. That way, if there's something that looks like it's affecting your cloud environment, you can at least have a way to protect it. And then yeah, finally, I know for a long for a long time, just talking about the cloud access and, and really the web in general, you know, the attitude has, has been in a lot of places that we're just not going to use things like Box or OneDrive or Dropbox. Um, but that <laughs> that's not working anymore, right? Like we yeah. need a way to be able to collaborate <laughs> with partners and, and customers and vendors. Um, so if, if data is going to be going up there, we need a way to ensure that only – the right data is going up there, right? So doing things like DLP to, to make sure, you know, we, we have a corporate Dropbox account, let's say, but um, there shouldn't be customer data in it. So if there's PII, you know, social security numbers or credit card numbers in the clear, we want to be able to detect that, um, alert on it, and, and take action. So that's where a, a cloud access security broker can really kick in and, and help with stuff like that. And so this covers uh, just the, the path of throwing from your employee all the way all the way to the website. So again, we'd love the chance to go with you, mark these for you as you go across, update these to whatever solution you're using, provide it to you as a PowerPoint so that way you can either present up on a case of why you need a solution. Because look, there's a huge hole that we're missing right here in this spot that we just want to try to empower you the best you can to make your environment the most secure as possible. And that will move us on to the there we go. Now we'll move on to the last one, which is breach defense through email. Uh, this is extremely popular right now with everybody working from home. They're distracted. Uh, maybe they're still not used to having to work from home. They have children. Everybody's, you know, it's just a more active environment than before. So your attention span, maybe you're not able to fully look to see like, oh, yeah, that that doesn't look like it's from me. Uh, from a person I know to where nowadays it's like, oh, I was waiting for something. This looks like it's click. What happens now? So this is just going through if you have attackers that are trying to do phishing, if you are sending links or an evil payload across, how do we put security across that? So first off, as it comes through, you want some type of email security. Um, Microsoft, I think you do like an E5 before they start doing some type of either security on here, but there's a ton of different vendors out there, but you do want something that's going to inspect that email that's coming in to at least, if it's, if it is a phishing, you know, block it, do it some type of retroactive to where if you're able to, oh, this is bad, pull it from all mailboxes, be able to do functions of that, that you want an anti-spam, all of these set up over here. Um, we have, of course, like I said, Cisco email security. There's different vendors, but you do want something that's actually looking at that email that's coming across. But let's say it did come in. For whatever reason, it didn't get checked. This person actually clicks on the link. What's the first thing that it's going to try and do? It's going to try and reach out to somewhere on the web that's got the next steps that it needs to do to actually start implementing that, play, that payload that's on it. You want that's That's when the DNS security comes in handy to ensure that uh, I don't know where that playing is trying to reach. We're going to block it, or we know that's an actual known malware or a uh, bad site. We're going to make sure that gets blocked and not just blocked. I'm also going to notify the, hey, we've got devices that are trying to reach out to a known, not just questionable, a known bad thing. You might want to look at this device. So this is where that DNA's, uh, DNS security is so important to where it's stopping the first step. Let's say we have no solution here. Hopefully, then your firewall is going to start inspecting the traffic that's going across. But once again, we talked about how it's hard. Everything is encrypted traffic. So how do you know what's actually in there if you don't have either some type of decryption, uh, if you don't have geo on, if it's trying to reach out to North Korea or somewhere that you need visibility into those packets. So hopefully you have a firewall with services enabled that's able to kind of see what's happening on that traffic flow. 
if again you it gets past all of those, gets past DNS, it gets through the firewall, and it's coming back and it's actually hitting the machine, your last resort then is why endpoint protection is so vital is hopefully your malware or antivirus will see this and not just see it, either isolate, quarantine, or if you have a solution in place to where uh, this device, we don't have any way of, of isolating it, we need to just kick it off the network and put it in the hush zone. It can't talk anything. You get alerted and you start working on getting that device cleaned back on the network so that user can be helping to, uh, to drive performance again. So this is where this is a very important segment i see a lot now especially with so many you know if you go working from home coffee shops if you're just trying to check something real fast an attention span if you know it looks like i know this person and spoof uh phishing is it's amazing how well they make these emails <laughs> look legit oh, that you weren't expecting it so what i really like about this chart too i mean if we take the email piece out of it and we just look at the, the right four solutions. I think that applies to every single end user operating outside of our perimeter, right? And right now, that's like 90% of users, right? Everybody's working from home or, you know, we're starting to integrate back into the offices slowly but surely. Um, but my, my point is, is that if an if a end user is sitting at home and you don't have them firewalled with a small office router or small office firewall or something like that, then the other parts of the solution become even more important than they were before, right? The DNS security, the anti-malware, antivirus, um, you know, that might literally be the, the only thing protecting an endpoint as it roams into a coffee shop or wherever. Yep. Um, so that, that's what I, I really love about the DNS security piece is it works well in every scenario we've talked about today, right? And, you know, for a long time, I, I kind of always go back to, it used to be we'd go into the office and be behind the firewall and behind the proxy, and that's how we were protected. Anymore, you know, so much of the workforce is mobile that um, we need to be able to protect those assets even when they're they're abroad. So, yep. and not just that, so much of what you're trying to reach is mobile too. So you're not just putting things. But once it leaves, how do you ensure you're actually going to a spot that you need to? Um, but yeah, this is. The coverage for a breach defense is where again we can get with you, change this to your solution. If you're if there's, if there's one missing to help you make your use case on why you need to get those. But again, security as an onion is very vital in today's world to where hopefully you have that phase approach to try and lock everything down. Um, I think we we still got a few minutes that maybe Jay we talk about the importance of having like VPN clients and some of the best practices there where you want where this comes into play, not just for email, but if you're home, you still want that DNS protection because it's not going through your normal access. Um, things like split tunnel, do you really want all that traffic coming across back to the data center just to go up the internet to where if you have these security policies on your endpoint, just use the person's internet to go across there. Um, so yeah, maybe just spend a few, few minutes on that if you wanna you want to run with that one, Jay. Well, I mean, we could still tag team it, but just kind of... Yeah, well one thing actually I really want to touch on is I think it's important these solutions work together. Um, you know, e even if it's multiple vendors, you know, we, we have ways of, of uh, integrating with different vendors just depending on the scenario. But, you know, Cisco email security with AMP is great. Cisco AMP for endpoints is great. It's great though that those two work together yeah. because if email security lets something through, um, and then later we find out, hey, um, this file got sent up to Threat Grid. We went ahead and sent it through anyway because we were wait waiting on the response back to Threat Grid. Threat Grid blew it up and found out, oh my gosh, this is ransomware. This is like zero day ransomware. Um, Cisco Email Security knows, oh, okay, these 10 users yeah. all got that file sent to them, um, to these 10 assets, and can actually go back and do file trajectory to say, hey, AMP for endpoints. I just found out this file is bad. It's a zero day. We're the first company to discover it, of course. Of course, that's how it always works, right? And uh, you need to go quarantine that file or, you know, start inspecting them, maybe quarantine them from the network. So I think it's all part of that, that integrated solution. But, yeah, v VPN is a, uh, a great example of something that we're seeing a lot of now, right? That, that's why I liked this slide, even though we didn't really touch on VPN here. But, 
you know, you still you need to be able to do good math. You need to be able to do good profiling and posturing and, and verify, you know, okay, this, this device is connecting to my SSL VPN. Um, is it a corporate asset? Um, that's where NAT can kick in and, and tell us things like that. Is it up on its, its AMP definitions or AV definitions? Um, does it have Windows Firewall enabled if, if we want it enabled? Um, that, that's a big piece of that puzzle, too. Let me, I'm going to add one thing real fast that I thought was really cool, and I didn't know you could do this with Duo, is let's say you don't have a NAC to ensure that the device that you're looking for is actually a corporate device. Uh, one of my customers was able to use Duo with their v, uh, ASA v, VPN to ensure that that device was a corporate device, either by checking to see what the, you know, if it had the certificate from Windows to be part of the domain, that, you know, it's just one another one of those lookups that, you have extra tools, even though you may not have a knack. Well, can you utilize a different tool that you're using for either multi-factor to then also check that device? So there's a lot of cool aspects that you may not always be aware of the solutions you have to either reach out to Jay and I, if you do have some of these, to see all the full capabilities that they have with them to do a refresh. And I think the one thing I want to mention, I mean, when you do, if, if, for, if you're a Cisco customer, all of this is backed by Talos. And I think that I forgot to mention that is like, we have a security group that's only job is to always constantly keep checking what's going on out there to find the latest threats, update it. And it's not just updated on, let's say like the firepower threat defense or the services running here. It's gonna be updated across the whole platform. So Umbrella is gonna get updated. Cisco email security is gonna get updated. All of these, all your tools will be updated at the same time rather than, well, my vendor from at 1A, well, you know, hasn't found it yet, but well, my vendor at the here has this solution. I have to go now manually put this type of thread inside of it that with Cisco, all of this is done by Talos uh, to ensure that we're constantly catching the new threats that are being done. Because that's the other thing that's always going to change. You just need to make sure you're aware or at least have the capability to know what's happening today and prepare for tomorrow. It's super dynamic and we'll we'll go further into it on a future session when uh, we drill into Umbrella probably. but. Um, for a long time, vendors have been reactive, you know, AV vendors, right? Like a virus gets released, somebody discovers it, they blow it up, they figure out the hash, they update the definitions, definitions get um, downloaded to local clients weekly or monthly or whatever, right? Um, that, that doesn't help us when the virus has been out for weeks now, <laughs> you know, and my, my entire network already has it. Um, so... Talos is a two-way street, right? I mean, not only is their, their findings from their research update our products, but our products update the findings to their research. So they, they see spikes in, whoa, this domain got registered five minutes ago and has already had a million hits. Like, yep. that's strange. And it looks like a pseudo-random stream. Um, and they can even automatically, you know, make – that take action based on findings like that. Um, so I, I just find that fascinating. That that stuff is so dynamic, um, and, and some of the algorithms and stuff they use is, is really brilliant. Um, I'd love to drill into it on on a future session. But yep. yeah, it's it's important to keep in mind that is a two way street. So um, you know, being a big vendor means Talos has a lot of info to pull from for their research. Yeah, and then the the last thing I'll add on here before we close up for the day is. If you all, are, if you are a Cisco customer, you also have access to Cisco Threat Response. So the ability to see if, for whatever reason, we got to the point of it's hitting umbrella or an email, you can take the, the hash from uh, Talos Online where they publish the articles about a certain vulnerability. You can, you're like, if you see that, and you're like, I want to know if this is actually happening in my environment. You copy that, you paste it into CTR, and the more you have to funnel up to that, you can see that actually, yeah, that file did it. Came across your firewall over here. There was a DNS request request for it with an email that came across to this user at this time, to where you can see that whole picture as it crawls across your network, and it just, it's literally a chain that you can just follow as the path was there to know. Oh, this device, so I need to isolate this now. And they have the ability to just right click from inside CTR to start pushing policies either from AMP um, or other solutions you've got to be able to start locking that down. It it was pretty powerful when I saw how you literally just copy that from Talos. Or there's even like a plugin. So if you have Google Chrome, you literally just 
click on it, it gets the keys, sends it to CTR, pulls it up, and you get to see if that's actually happening in your environment anywhere or when it, when it did happen. So then you can start taking the yeah. steps to be secure from it. That's, that's an important distinction because, you know, finding malware on a machine thanks to our endpoint protection is good, right? We can deal with that. But how did it get there? You know, that, that's important too because that helps us take a few steps back and go, who else may have been impacted, right? You know, if this was a, a phishing email that came through, who all did that email go to? You know, maybe only one person out of 100 clicked it, um, but it's still good to know about those other 99 and be able to retroactively pull that stuff back. You know, if it was a, a thumb drive in the parking lot somebody picked up and brought in, we want to know that too. Um, but yeah, that, that could be a great tool in figuring out the root cause of how malware got into the network and got executed. All right. So I think the last thing we'll kind of awesome. finish off here. I'm going to move this over. Just so everybody knows, we are, um, sorry, we had, did have to move Cisco Live. I think Chuck had mentioned, if you haven't seen it, watch his video, um, our CEO that had mentioned it didn't feel like it was the right time we need to be focusing on other priorities especially with what's happening in our society today just to make sure we know where we are um that we've moved it to june 16th and 17th so and it looks like what's happened is they literally just moved the session so if you're already registered you don't have to re-register you don't have to find new sessions yeah. all that and whatever was planned on those that tuesday wednesday are going to happen again on 16th and 17th so literally just adjust your schedule to if you can catch those sessions on the 16th and 17th. And then, of course, if you guys can't, or gals cannot make this, it's going to be just like before. You can watch this on demand. Their videos will get released. You can always come back. But if you wanted that experience of being there, I think they've got rooms set up to where you can actually talk with other people in there to, or try to connect with other um, engineers on some of these topics that it's a, it should still be a great time if it's not happening in life, even if we did have to move it back a little bit. But there shouldn't be a lot of changes you need to do on your sessions or anything. I just want to make sure everybody knows that's coming up. So hopefully you, uh, like I kind of joked that we were, uh, you know, the hot thing, even though Cisco Live was still going and we still, we still had our Friday multicast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad everybody's able to tune in and hang out with us. Um, our, our next session um, will actually be that same week is Cisco Live again, two weeks from now. See, man, um, they're trying to piggyback so, off us. That's what... <laughs> right? They've been following our schedule. That's right. So the next session, we're going to be talking about containerization, containers, uh, Docker, Kubernetes, Cisco Container Platform. What are all these different things? You know, it's a term that I've been hearing get thrown around for several years now, and I've, as a network engineer, never really understood what it was or why I needed to care. Um, but, you know, it's coming in hot. Um, so we're just going to do a little, you know, 40, 45 minute session and, and talk about what containers are, how they're being used, and uh, do some some demos and some tinkering. So it'll be a lot of fun to kind of lab some of that stuff out. So hope to see you guys in a couple weeks. And uh, is there anything we can do to help you out? Definitely let us know. If you want to run through this this PowerPoint that we had in your environment, reach out and uh, we can set up some time and interview that with you. All right. Well, Jay, have a great weekend. And everybody that joined, thank you so much. Have a great weekend, too. And we uh, hope to talk with everybody soon. Thanks, guys. See you.